Do you have anything in your life that can just bring you right back to a certain moment in time? Perhaps there's a song that can bring you right back to the homecoming dance when you were dancing with your first crush. Or maybe it's the smell of cinnamon and apples that brings you right back to grandma's kitchen. Or maybe when you see a sunset, it brings you right back to a moment in time when you were so in awe of God's creation that you just had to take a picture. Well, the words from Philippians 2 bring me right back to a moment in time when I was a teenager. It was the 80s and I had a giant boombox <laughs> that I would love to play cassettes on and listen to music. And the cassette that I remember listening to over and over again was one that I had purchased after a youth encounter team had played at my church. Now I know I loved all of their songs, but what stands out to me the most was the reading of Philippians 2 in a young woman's voice. I was just so overcome with emotion by hearing about how Jesus humbled himself and made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant for me and for us. I was so in awe of how the one who was the greatest, who was God, who had all the rights and privileges of being God, set those all aside to become a baby and to live among us and to love so completely and to obey God so completely that he would suffer and die on a cross to forgive us of our sins and to give us an abundant life, us puny humans who most of the time don't even appreciate it. Well, I was just so grateful for that grace. And I would think of the words of Tony Campolo when he said, after everything Jesus has done for me, there's nothing I wouldn't do for him. And although I related to those words, there have also been times in my life when I've related more to the son in Jesus's parable who said, I will go to work for you, but then failed to follow through. Seems like pride has a way of getting in my way of fulfilling the instructions in those verses from Philippians. I mean, for instance, take putting others' needs ahead of my own. Well, that's hard to do in the little things, let alone in big things. Well, take for instance, a four-way stop. Now that's probably a little thing, but you would not believe how little grace I have for the person who goes out of turn at a four-way stop. If they go ahead of me, I'm sitting there thinking, I was here first. It was my turn to go and you just took off. If I don't see a woman in labor in your back seat, then your need to get somewhere does not trump mine. <laughs> But I'm also kind of a hypocrite when it comes to the four-way stop because if I'm the one who goes out of turn, then I think, well, everyone should just understand I have so much going on. I probably had a lot on my mind and I just wasn't paying attention. So stop honking at me. <laughs> or what about our call to be of the same mind? Really? In the 21st century? In this polarized community that we live in? I mean, we narrowly escaped a government shutdown last week because our leaders can't be of the same mind. I'm not saying I could do it any better, just that it's really hard to accomplish. And what about thinking of others as better than ourselves? That's hard too. I mean, how many times are we confronted with one of our shortcomings? And the first thing that comes to our mind is, well, at least I'm not as bad as dot, dot, that fill in the name or the group of people that you fail to see their giftedness because you think that you are better than they are. We're all guilty of this. We're supposed to be humble, but it feels like pride is our default. So how do we become humble? Well, I was listening to a devotion the other day and they were talking about the effects of pride versus humility on a community. They said that pride is the only disease that makes everyone else sick in the room, except for the person who has it because it's so off-putting. But humility, on the other hand, 
makes everyone else in the room feel better because it makes them feel like a friend. I don't think any of us wants to show up and be off-putting. It's really a blind spot. So what is the key to putting aside pride and being someone who is humble and whose presence is a blessing? Maybe we should look back at the scripture again to see if we can find some help there. Our scripture, Philippians 2, is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church called the Philippians. And the Philippians were near and dear to Paul's heart. He was writing to encourage them. And he was writing from prison where he had, was being punished for preaching the gospel of Christ. But Paul didn't let that get in his way. He thought, well, what gifts do I have that I could give to the Philippians here in this situation? I know, I could still write them a letter. So he writes them this encouraging letter. And Paul's words in Philippians, those part, words that really hit me when I was a teenager about who Jesus is and what Jesus does, are thought to have been maybe a hymn or something that the Philippians knew really well by heart from their worship. Paul is bringing them right back to a moment in time when they knew that Jesus' love for them was real. So if we want to uh, be humble, one of the keys is that we begin by focusing on how Christ became, came among us and continues to come among us. And when Paul talks about working out our salvation with fear and trembling, he doesn't say that to make us be afraid that we might mess everything up and then be rejected by God. No, fear and trembling is just the natural result of being in the presence of a God who is so powerful and whose love is so unrelenting that it brings us to our knees. And that's exactly where we need to be to look up and to look out. And the Holy Spirit produces the energy and the humility and even the will for us to share our gifts with the world. And you know what? Some of the best and most impactful ministry that is done in our world is done by lay people. That's people who have not been to seminary. For instance, I know a woman named Sue who was a UPS driver. She went to this weekend uh, retreat that was called Curcio. At that retreat, she learned the basics of being a Christian and what Jesus has done for her. She had gone to church her whole life, but she said it had kind of been like going through the motions because she didn't completely understand it before this time. Well, not only did she learn about Jesus and what Jesus did, but when she was on this retreat, she was surprised to get mail every day. And in that mail were letters from people uh, that she knew who were encouraging her, but even from strangers, just people who had been through the same experience that wanted to encourage others in their faith. And Sue was blown away to realize after it was done that there had been people praying for her 24 hours around the clock. The gifts of others helped her to really realize the gift of Jesus. And she wanted to find a way to share this gift with people when she got home. Well, Sue found her calling in fifth grade communion instruction. Her church had a lock-in for the kids who were receiving first communion instruction. And Sue thought, I could lead that and I will model it after my experience at Curcio. She thought that she could help the kids to learn about Jesus' love by showering them with gifts and attention and making them feel really loved. Well, Sue turned her uh, driving a UPS truck into a way to bless. When she went on her route, she would ask individuals and businesses along the way if they would like to donate gifts for the fifth graders. And she collected a ton of stuff. Sue's husband, Rich, was a woodworker his part was making cross necklaces for the kids and also making these super deluxe hot dog sticks for the bonfire. When other people at church saw the enthusiasm that Rich and Sue had, they wanted to get in on it too. 
So some people brought food, other people sewed stoles, some people wrote encouraging notes, others were chaperones, and some were praying for the kids throughout the experience. These fifth graders are adults now, and if you were to ask them to remember a moment in time when they knew that the love of Jesus was real, they will be brought right back in time to their first communion experience. Imagine what a difference it would make if we all took a long, loving look at Christ this week. Perhaps you might take another look at Philippians 2 and let that grace and the humility of Christ soak deeper into your heart. Or perhaps you will worship God this week by admiring and being in awe of God in nature. Maybe the fall colors will humble and delight you. Maybe you will recognize and appreciate how God is using the gifts of others to bless you, especially those people who might surprise you. If driving a truck and carving wood can be the means that deliver God's love to someone else, then whatever humble gifts you have can also be used to bless someone this week. Turn your attention to the one who emptied himself for you and who is filling you with love enough to share. Praise be to God. Amen.